Hey, my name's Jeremy, and I have the privilege of serving as the lead pastor here at Shelter Cove. And I just want to say thank you so much for tuning in with us today. I firmly believe you're going to be encouraged, you're going to be inspired, but most of all, that God's going to do something through this message that's going to move you closer to Jesus. Thanks again for tuning in. It's great to see you. I'm excited. We're in this uh, Elephant in the Room series, as you can see, and we've been tackling a difficult topic every message, every week. We've talked about pride. We've talked about racism. We've talked about gluttony. By the way, what's your favorite candy? Anyway, we've talked about sex. We're not shying away from anything here. Today, we have an Elephant in the Room topic, and if an Elephant in the Room can be defined as a difficult subject that is necessary to deal with, and yet people are reluctant to talk about it because of the complexity of the issue. Well, what we're going to talk about today definitely fits that criteria on more than one front. First of all, based on the text that we're going to be looking at today, it's an elephant in the room. One of the more difficult texts, I think, in the, in the whole of the Bible uh, is our text today. Uh, I wish I had a nickel for every time over the years people have come up to me as they do to all pastors at some point and say, I'm really struggling with this passage. Can you help me out? Oh, really? Where's the passage? It's in Hebrews. I know exactly where they're going. They're going to talk about Hebrews chapter 6. You can turn there right now. We're going to look at Hebrews 6. Very difficult text in Scripture. And uh, we're going to look at 12 verses, but I just want to read the about three verses from verse 4 to verse 6 to demonstrate just how challenging this passage is. So if you can turn there, Hebrews 6, starting in verse 4, why don't we just stand together and we'll read three verses to show the complexity of this chapter, okay? Verse 4, for it is impossible, he says, in the case of those who have once been enlightened who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit and have tasted the goodness of the Word of God, the powers, uh, the, uh, powers of the age to come. Now, who does it sound like he's describing right there? It almost sounds like Christians, doesn't it? Uh, sounds like a believer. But then it says in verse 6, and have then fallen away. Uh-oh. It's impossible if they fall away to restore them again to repentance since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding Him up to contempt. All right, well, you can see very quickly here how challenging this passage is. If I look at that, and I'm of the uh, persuasion that as an evangelical, as a churchgoer, a traditionalist, if I believe that once saved, always saved, and I read that and I go, well, if these are Christians here, it looks like not only should I not be once saved, always saved, maybe I need to be once lost, always lost. It's a difficult passage. You can be seated. All right? But not only is it difficult and, and, and important to call this an elephant in the room based on the text, but also because of the timeliness of this subject right here. If you've paid attention to the news over the last month and a half or so, you've noticed that there's some prominent Christian personalities in Christian culture, in Christian community, who have come out with some statements that are rather unsettling. There's a guy named Joshua Harris. You may know who Joshua Harris is. Years ago in the 90s, he wrote a runaway bestseller, a popular Christian book called I Kissed Dating Goodbye. And in this book, he advocated for a, a move away from traditional dating for the Christian single and a move toward more of a... ...undergone a massive shift in regard to my faith in Jesus. He said the popular phrase for this is deconstruction. The biblical phrase is falling away. That's the phrase in our text today. He said, by all the measurements I have for defining a Christian, I am not a Christian. What a sad and tragic statement to hear from someone so respected and influential among the Christian community. And it was just a few weeks later, Hillsong United worship leader Marty Sampson issued a statement of his own saying, I am genuinely losing my faith. And it doesn't bother me want to address today the questions on the minds of Christians who see this sort of thing happening and they're asking what is this that we're observing here are these people losing their salvation were they never saved to begin with are they still saved and they just are struggling with something can they come back what is it the only way I know how to analyze such questions is to analyze it through the lens 
of Scripture. And that's what we're going to do. And this, as difficult a task as it may be, it's leading us to Hebrews chapter 6, which means we need to pray. Would you bow your head with me? Heavenly Father, as we look at this text today, we need your humility. We need your grace. We need your wisdom. Lord, we need your spirit. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hebrews 6. Does Hebrews 6 describe those who lose their Christian faith? Here's what we know uh, for sure from this text. At a minimum, it's describing people who are in Christian community, they are invested in Christian culture, and they have in a very public way departed from that community. All right, or at least the beliefs of that community. There are four things that we need to understand about this text today. First of all, we need to understand the offense of those who fall away. What is their offense? Uh, here's a little background to this book. Now, what's the name of this book that we're reading today? It, it, it's called he- Last night somebody said, The Bible. <laughs> You're not wrong. Uh, Hebrews, right? Meaning, what is their background? What is their ethnicity? They are... Jews, right? They're Jewish. They are a Jewish community of believers. They come from Judaism. They have identified collectively with Christ, but their background is in Judaism. And the author has observed them over time, and he's observed that there has not been an overwhelming shift in their move away from their former practices and beliefs. And there are some of them who are, who are very clearly Christian, but there are a number of them who uh, retain their old Judaistic beliefs, and they look and sound an awful lot like the Jews of the Old Testament. And so he begins to address them. And in verse 1 he says this. He says, Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and move on toward maturity. Now why is he saying this? What's he talking about? He says, let us leave the elementary doctrine. What is the elementary doctrine? That's the basic teachings about the one called Christ. The elementary doctrine of of Christ. To the Jew, the word Christ is the same thing as the word Messiah. The Christ is the Messiah, the chosen one sent by God, the Savior who will come and deliver them. Throughout the Old Testament era, there were deep misunderstandings on the part of the Jews about who Messiah is, what Messiah was coming to do, and there were vestiges of those misunderstandings in the community uh, that is being addressed here today. And he's saying, look, you guys should know the basic doctrine. It was apparent to you from the the Old Testament. You should already know this. In fact, in Hebrews 5, the the author has said to them already, you should be teaching this stuff by now, but I'm having to reteach you. You should be consuming solid food, but I'm having to feed you with a bottle. These elementary doctrines, folks, these are like the baby books of the faith. You have to get them, understand them, embrace them so that you can move on from them. Not abandon them, but but establish it and and grow and graduate. When you learn to read, you you were given some baby books, right? You were given C. Dick and Jane. or You guys remember Dick and Jane? That was a long time ago, wasn't it? But what happened? Are you guys still reading those? No! When you go to my office, you're not going to find a copy of Curious George. Okay, mainly because Pastor Jeremy borrowed my copy. Anyway... You graduate from that stuff, and he's saying, look, I'm going to have to go over this again with you. It's time to move on from here. And he lays out what these elementary doctrines of Christ are. And folks, what they are is, they're the gospel. It's the gospel. And this gospel is made apparent to them in the Old Testament, and it's the same gospel in the New Testament. And he describes six components of the elementary doctrine of Christ in verse 1 and 2. And I've laid them out for you in your gather card today. You see them listed there. Let's walk through them, all right? He says, let's not lay again a foundation of repentance from dead works. Folks, that's component number one of the elementary doctrine. It's this, salvation is not by human works. How many of you know that? Are you saved by works? No. That, that's Christianity 101 right there. You're not saved by works. Does the Old Testament teach you that you're saved by your human works? No, the Old Testament does not teach that. If anything, we know that the law was given. Could anybody keep the law? Perfectly. Anybody? No. And so the message of the Old Testament is that nobody can keep the law, right? And so you move on to number two here. He says we've got to move on from faith toward God. Folks, that's component number two. Salvation is by faith 
alone. You are not justified by works. You are justified by faith. Abraham, Genesis 15, he's justified by his faith. Habakkuk says the righteous live by faith. The author of Hebrews in chapter 11 is going to say, without faith, it's impossible to please God. You are justified by faith. And then number three, he says we got to move on from instruction about washings. Now, what is he talking about? Well, the Jew would understand this concept that the priest in the Old Testament era had to be ceremonially clean. Before they could conduct any priestly duties, they had to be washed. They had to undergo some sort of a cleansing ritual to be clean before God, okay? But the Christian understands that to stand clean before God, what do you need? You need forgiveness. Salvation results in forgiveness. When you stand before God, it's because the blood of Christ has washed away your sin and you have received forgiveness, all right? And then he says we got to move on from the imputation of sin and righteousness. And uh, that is based on this, the laying of hands, the laying on of hands. The Jew would understand that, that phrase because the priest, when conducting a sacrifice, they would put their hands on that lamb and they would pray after laying hands on the lamb, symbolically the sin of the nation would be transferred to that animal who would then be led away to its death and that blood sacrifice would, would symbolize an atonement for the sin of the people. Now, that's what the laying on of hands represents, but it, it is but a picture of one day the holy lamb of God, what's his name? Jesus Christ, he's going to go to the cross, and while he's on the cross, there is an imputation of our sin to him. Our sin is laid upon him. He is crucified. When we put faith in his work on the cross, his righteousness is laid upon us. That's the imputation of his righteousness. You follow? I'm throwing some big stuff at you today. And then we move on. He says, we got we to gotta move on here from the resurrection of the dead. That's basic right there. And what that means for us is that salvation results in resurrection. Believer, when you were saved, not only were you raised spiritually, not only was your old nature put to death and you are a new creature, a new creation in Christ, but one day you will literally physically be raised from the dead. you believe that? Is that good to hear? You glad to trade in the old body for something new? I am absolutely right. And that concept is even found in the Old Testament. The Jews should know this in the book of Job. He says, I know that my Redeemer lives, and in the end shall stand on the earth. And though my skin be destroyed, in my flesh shall I see God. There is a day when we will be raised. And then the final component here, he says we've got to move on from eternal judgment. That is a basic principle of the gospel and the believer understands that salvation removes God's wrath from you because when you are raised from the dead one day all of us believing and unbelieving will be raised the unrighteous will go where into eternal judgment where will the righteous go when they are raised they will go into everlasting life amen that's good news folks that's the gospel those are the six basic components of the gospel but what is the offense of the people who have fallen away? In your notes, it's this. They reject, ultimately, a gospel that saves. Because they are seeking to import a, a, a warped view of the law, the misunderstanding that they have long had that it is works that save. And they're trying to bring that into their Christian culture. And they are rejecting the true gospel. You say, well, we don't struggle with that. I mean, we're not, a, we're not, we're not a, a community of Jewish Christians. We don't have that Judaistic background, so we're not dipping back into that heritage. No, but we do different things to reject the gospel in the church today. And we do it without forsaking the label Christian. And in the church today, across our country and around the world, there is a cancer taking hold. It's, it goes by the name progressive Christianity. All right? Used to call it the old emergent church. It's changed names. It'll change names probably three or four more times. That's just how these things work. But what it is, it's, a, it's, it's capturing the imagination of young people in the church, and it's, it's appealing to their modern sensibilities and the philosophies that they have embraced in the world, and they reject the basic principles of the gospel. And they look at these things. I want you to look at the first three here. They look at the, the elementary doctrine, and they are made uncomfortable by that. 
They look at salvation, not by human works, and they say, oh, wait a minute, I, that, I, that's offensive. Look, I believe in the potential of man. I believe man is basically good. And really, isn't that what salvation is? It's just the ideal of what this world can be if we would just treat each other, if we would just pursue good works and follow Christ's example. That's really what the gospel is. And they see component number two, salvation by faith alone. They go, oh, I can't handle that. That's exclusivity. Why, that's claiming that you have the only way. Why, who among us? us can claim that i mean who are we really to judge other people jews and muslims and buddhists and hindus and all that and you know god loves all people and we need to not be concerned with who's in who's out and, and universally he embraces all of us we're just all doing the best that we can and they see component number three here salvation results in forgiveness and they say whoa, 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 whoa. you're you're implying that there's something wrong with me that I was created in sin. And you, you're saying God hates sin. Well, then he must hate me. And I can't get my head around that. And so I reject that. And they look at the next component, salvation with imputation of sin and righteousness. And they say, whoa, 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 whoa. You're talking about some kind of a sacrifice here, the atonement? The atonement is a horrible doctrine that God would send his own son to be crucified. What kind of a bloodthirsty God is this that we serve that he would demand a sacrifice of his own son? That's, that's cosmic child abuse right there. I can't accept that. And then he says salvation results in resurrection. You're, oh, hold on. You're talking about heaven? Heaven is a real, literal place? Come on, you know better than that. Heaven's a metaphor. Heaven's just the ideal for this world, what it can be if we would just follow Christ's example. It's, it's, it, we need to strive for heaven on earth in a literal sense. And then he sees this thing about God's wrath being removed, and he says, I can't accept that. The, the concept of hell is just a human invention. Don't you know that? If anything, it's a metaphor for the atrocities that we perpetuate on one another. And for someone to say that God would send people to a literal hell, billions of people, simply because they don't believe, how narcissistic and vengeful do you think God is? Do you see what I'm saying? You say, is that really being embraced in the church of Jesus Christ? You better believe it is. It's happening all over. It's happening in the lives of people that I know and love. And you don't need to renounce Christ, literally, verbally, and say there is no God in order to fall away. You can fall away theologically. And there will be no difference between you doing that and the person who says there is no God. It's the same offense when you reject the true gospel. Second thing we need to understand, we need to understand the identity of, of those who fall away. Who are these people who are falling away? How does the author describe them? Well, in verse 3, he says, and this we will do if God permits. This we will do. What will we do? He says we need to leave the elementary teachings, get them settled, understand them, accept them, and move on toward maturity. That's what we're going to do if God permits. All right? What is move on toward maturity? What is that? That's called becoming a disciple, right? You are becoming a developed, a fully developed disciple. This implies that there is a type of person that God will not permit to become a fully developed disciple. Why not? Because they have not yet embraced the gospel. We just started a discipleship process called Pathway. Some of you may be in Pathway. We started last week. If you want to get in on the next round, we're starting 101 all over again in November. And you can sign up. You go to inthecove.com, register for that. But you know what I cover in the introductory session of Pathway? We go over the gospel. Why? I thought this was a discipleship process. You can't become a disciple if you have not embraced the gospel. And so we begin right there. So God's not going to permit. So what kind of people are these? If he won't permit them to move on toward maturity, they are people who have not received the gospel. Are they Christians? But Scott, they're described in chapter 6, verse 4 as, as those who've been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who've shared in the Holy Spirit, as we read at the top. But despite the language used, I'm here to tell you in your notes, these are not believers, but they are those who have professed faith, but never possessed faith 
These are unbelieving people who externally, they look the part. They've made a profession of faith. They could tell you a day and date when they became a Christian and their attendance record at church has been sterling and they've shown up here and they've been in Bible study after Bible study. Maybe they even led a Bible study. They could have handed you a Bible. They could have greeted you at the door with a smile. They, they know all the lyrics to the worship songs. They can quote chapter and verse, but there's something inauthentic in them. And whatever outward zeal they manifest, it is rooted not in authenticity, but it's rooted in something either experiential or intellectual, but it's never been personal. And it's never taken root. And they're among us, but they're not of us. And eventually, they return to the old way of thinking. And they even abandon Christian culture, perhaps, or perhaps not. But they are what the Bible calls apostates. And 1 John 2.19 describes those who depart the faith. He says, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they'd been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they all are not of us. He's saying they were never real. They were never saved. Okay, I, I quoted this verse on a video in, in the wake of the Joshua Harris revelation a few weeks ago. I went on, uh, I, we posted a video to YouTube and I quoted this verse. You should have seen some of the backlash I got for this. People were like, oh, that is so pathetic to say. How typical for Christians to say that those who leave the church were never really good Christians. How typical. One guy said, how dare you? I was a Born again, sincere believer, and I left the faith. How dare you say I was never really saved? How fascinating is that response? I'm not even sure I understand that, that, that you would be offended that I would imply that you were not, that it never really was real for you. And by the way, don't get mad at me. I didn't say it. John said it. All right? Pastor Scott, how do you know these are not true believers? Look, the language used. I know it sounds convincing enlightened, tasted, shared. But listen, the author is using language that takes us right up to the point of describing an authentic Christian, but it stops short. And there is no uniquely Christian language being used. There's nothing that is exclusive to Christian in that description right there. If he wanted to make this a slam dunk and say, these are born again people, he'd maybe use the term born again. He did said uh, he he would have said there, it's impossible in the case of those who have been saved, in the case of those who've been redeemed, justified, declared righteous, restored, indwelled, baptized in the Holy Spirit, reconciled to God, made holy something. But he doesn't. Instead, we get they've been enlightened. That's the Greek word fotizo. It means to receive instruction. All right? They've, they've understood it. They've perceived it intellectually. They get it. They understand the gospel. He said that they have uh, they've, uh, tasted of the heavenly gift. That's the Greek word giomai. It means to perceive the flavor of something. They've just touched it to the tip of their tongue. They know what it tastes like, but they've never consumed it. They've never digested it. It's not become a part of them, right? He said that they've shared in the Holy Spirit. That's the Greek word metokos. You never see that word again in the New Testament, all right? He doesn't say that they've been baptized in the Holy Spirit, that they are regenerated, that they're filled, indwelled, sealed, empowered. No, they've just shared. They've experienced something, purely an experiential thing. Folks, it's a close encounter. That's it. It's a brush with Christ. Now, that brush may last years, but it's a brush nonetheless. Years ago, I was in Kansas City. I was staying at a hotel, and uh, the New York Yankees were in town, and they were there to play the Royals, and they were staying at my hotel. And I remember I got on the elevator, I went down a floor, the doors open, and in walks Don Mattingly. Now, I collected baseball cards as a kid, and Don Mattingly was one of the great players of my childhood, and he was a Yankee great, great slugger, you know, Hall of Famer type, and, and he walks in, and I just look at him. I'm just like... You're done medically. And he looks at me. He's like, how you doing? We shook hands. And he just, I just looked at him the whole elevator ride down. I was just like, you know, and the doors open. Don gets off. And I just watch him go. I'm just grinning. The door's shut. That was my stop. I didn't even budge, you know. Now, I could, I could misrepresent that experience. I could tell you guys, you know, <laughs> 
I remember years ago when Don Mattingly and I were in Kansas City together. Don said the funniest thing on the elevator. <laughs> Classic Don, you know. Were Don Mattingly and I in relationship? No. Now, to the casual observer, if we'd walked off that elevator together, right, talking, chuckling about something, somebody might have thought, oh, they know each other. But we don't. He's not going to see me years later and go, hey, elevator guy. No. He didn't know me from a hoot owl, okay? Same kind of thing. One day these people are going to stand before Christ if they don't change, and he's going to look at them. They're going to say, but we did this, we did this, we did this. He's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. I never knew you. And this is hard for people to understand because everybody knows somebody who was so authentic seeming. They were so sincere. They were in the church. They did good things. This is why people believe that you can lose your salvation. They know somebody who was devout and then they walk away and they go, I just can't believe that it was never real. They look at Joshua Harris and they go, he was a pastor. How can you be a pastor and not be saved? And by the way, I don't know Joshua Harris's heart. I don't have God's viewpoint to look into his soul. All I can do is take him at his word and pray for him, all right? And I don't know if there's something going on in his life, remorse over his marriage or guilt or whatever it's causing him to say things. We just got to pray for the guy. But here's what I want to tell you. Profession is meaningless. Experience is meaningless. Was Judas authentic? Was he ever the real deal? He was in ministry for three years. Judas preached. Judas participated in miracles with the other disciples. Judas walked with Jesus for three years every day physically, talking with him, interacting with him. He was never authentic. You say, well, maybe he was at some point. No. Jesus told the twelve long before the betrayal, he said, one of you is a devil. He's talking about Judas. Look, if Jesus says you're a devil, you ain't saved, dude. I'm sorry. Apostasy hides very well among the saints, but true believers do not apostatize. They do not. Uh, and remember, you don't have to renounce Christ to fall away from the faith. This community being addressed here in Hebrews 6, this is a religious community. No one in this community is saying, I renounce Christ. They're not saying that. They're not saying there is no God. They are importing an old philosophy, an old misunderstanding about salvation, and they are trying to merge it with their newfound Christian culture. So in your notes, they've attempted to merge old thinking with new Christian culture. They're dragging the law into the gospel, and they're trying to meld it right there. Jesus said in Matthew 5, you can't do that. That's like taking new wine and putting it into old wine skins. What happens? That new wine ferments and expands, and the old wine skins are stretched out, can't handle the pressure, they burst. What happens? You got ruined wine and ruined wine skins. Old covenant, new covenant does not work. And they're trying to make that work. And modern cultural Christians who try to bring in worldly philosophy into the church and make that work. It doesn't work. They, they take Christ, they take His grace, His mercy, His love, and they try to pour Him through this funnel into this man-made social construct that reflects worldly philosophy, something that is palatable to their modern sensibilities. And it's, 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 it's an insult to God. And you can't do that without changing the gospel. Because it becomes a social gospel. It becomes a moral gospel. It becomes a prosperity gospel. Whatever name you want to slap on it, they're all false gospels. And if you're trusting in any gospel other than the true gospel of Christ and Him crucified and risen, you're not born again. And we need to understand next in your notes the warning to those who fall away. There's a warning. It's a dire warning. The author of Hebrews says that these people who have gone through this, they've experienced these things, they've heard these things, they've learned these things. If they fall away, something is impossible. What's impossible? It's impossible, in verse 6, to restore them again to repentance. Now here's where this text kicks it up a notch in difficulty. It's impossible to restore them again to repentance. People go, whoa, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute, restore them again. 
Okay, Pastor Scott, you just said that they're non-believers. If they're non-believers, how can they be... What are we talking about again? That means that they repented before. If they're unbelievers, how could they have ever repented and not believe? Does the Bible talk about true repentance? Yes, it does. So if there's a true repentance, by definition, there must be a false repentance. Does the Bible describe that? You better believe it does. In 2 Corinthians, it's called worldly sorrow as opposed to godly sorrow which leads to life and to joy, right? Worldly sorrow leads to death and guilt because that's what it's rooted in. It's rooted in guilt and emotionalism. But it does not result in belief and it does not result in righteousness. And we see this false repentance. Esau repented, was not righteous. Judas, Matthew 27. The King James says in Matthew 27 that he repented himself. And he went back after he betrayed Christ and he tried to return the silver to those Jewish elites. Was there a redemption that happened in Judas' life when he did that? No, because it wasn't authentic. And what we need to understand for people who have fallen away that are in this state is this. In your notes, there is no hope for those who remain in unbelief. As long as you are in that state, there can be no repentance because you are hardened Right there, John 3, 18, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he's not believed in the name of the only, the only Son of God. The apostate heart in that state of rejection, while they're there, coming to a place of any kind of repentance is not possible. Is not possible. They can't remain in that state. The author says because they are crucifying once again, the Son of God to their own harm and holding Him up to contempt. What does it mean for them to crucify the Son of God again? What does that mean? How are they crucifying Christ again? Look, for the Jew, they would understand. The act of sacrificing a lamb is something that was done in the Old Testament era over and over and over and over again. Let me ask you a question. When any of those lambs were sacrificed, did any of that blood ever atone for anybody's sin? Not a single one. Not a single person was atoned for by the blood of a, 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 a regular old lamb. It was a picture. All of that was to picture the true lamb of God who would one day come, hang on a cross for our sin and suffer and die as the one-time, final, total, and complete sacrifice for all sin. And if you put your faith in that, in Jesus' work on the cross, you will be atoned for, you will be saved eternally. And he's saying to them in this sense that by bringing in the law, you are insulting God, you are treating Christ's work on the cross as just another repetition in a long line of meaningless sacrifices. And that's an affront to God. It's an insult. And cultural Christians do the same thing. When we embrace a progressive mindset, we say, well, Jesus is just, is just our way. It's just our way, but he's not the only way. We just throw him on the pile of meaningless worldviews and worldly beliefs systems. And the author moves on to verse 7 and says that for land that has drunk the rain that often falls on it and produces a crop useful to those for whose sake it's cultivated receives a blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and thistles, it is worthless and near, near to being cursed and its end is to be burned. What is all this talking about here? You know, the land fulfills its purpose. When the rain falls on it, what do we want to happen after the rain falls? We want fruit to come up. We want vegetation. We want growth. We want crops. That's what the farmer prays for, right? Let it rain so I can have some crops. And the rain is a blessing. When the earth receives the blessing, there's growth there. The life of a believer is authenticated by the fruitfulness in their life because belief bears fruit. What kind of fruit? Fruit of the Spirit. Because it's the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit living in the authentic believer, right? But listen to me, unbelief bears fruit, thorns, thistles, worldly thinking, worldly behavior. And the longer you remain in your unbelief, the more the fruit of unbelief is manifested. 
in your life. And this says that the end of all of that is to be burned. A field that does not produce after rain falls and falls and falls and nothing is yielded from that field. What does the farmer sometimes have to do with that field? He burns it. He burns it. And the, the fruitless life of the unbeliever in eternity, the end is to be burned. You say, well, I, I, this is why this is so hard for me. You see, I have loved ones who have they've come up in the church, but they've fallen away. Does this mean that there's no hope for them? Does this mean that they're now beyond salvation because they've rejected Christ? Are we past some invisible line known only to God where they cannot repent? They're not allowed to repent. God has cut them off. That's not how we see this here. Let me give you a glimmer of hope for them, okay? It says they are near to being cursed. We're near the curse. Has the curse been delivered on them yet? No. But folks, we're closer than we've ever been to judgment. Their end is to be burned. Are we at the end yet? We're not there yet, but we're closer than we've ever been. This is why in 2 Peter it says that the false teacher who has escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and then is again entangled in them and overcome. He says the last state has become worse for them than the first before they ever heard the truth. How, If they were an unbeliever the whole time and they've never believed, why are they worse off now that they're back out in the world than they were before they first heard the truth? Because they're closer to judgment than they've ever been. A friend of mine helped me process it in this way recently. He said, it's like if you're stranded at sea and the Coast Guard comes along and you wave them off. Never mind. I'm sorry. I'm okay. I'm all right. I'll, I'm going to figure this out. We're good. Thanks. Is your drowning a certainty? Well, no, it hasn't happened yet. There's still hope in there. But you just waved off the Coast Guard. You had an opportunity to be rescued, and you passed. And if you don't change your mindset about your need, you're going to drown. You're going to drown. What I don't want... I don't want anybody reading this text and going, well, this explains a lot. My neighbor must be an apostate. I've witnessed to that person for years, and they've rejected, rejected. I'm, I'm going to give them to God, and God's already given up on them, so I might as well give up on them. You don't get to do that. You persuade and persuade and persuade. Why? Because until they draw their dying breath, there's still a chance that they can be saved. D.L. Moody, great evangelist of the 19th century he had a holy hit list he had a list of a hundred names he prayed for these people he witnessed to these people do you know how many he won to christ over the course of his life out of those hundred names 97 wow right and then he died but guess what at deal moody's funeral the last three people on that list showed up and at his memorial they heard the gospel message and all three of them received Jesus Christ and were saved. It ain't over till it's over. And we got to keep after it. We got to keep after it. But listen, if you depart this life in unbelief, there is no sacrifice for sin. There is no redemption for you. You want to end on a good note? Let's end on a good note. How about some good news? We need to understand the promise. I love that word promise to those who are in Christ. In verse 9, he says, Though we speak in this way, in your case, beloved, beloved, we feel sure of better things, things that belong to salvation. The pronouns have changed. He's not talking about these and they. He's talking about you and your. He is now addressing the authentic believers in their midst. He's saying you who are born again. And he's sure of these things. Why? Because he sees the fruitfulness in their life. He says, for God is not unjust, verse 10, so as to overlook your work and the love you have shown for his name in serving the saints as you still do. They're sticking with the stuff. They have not fallen away. Here's the promise that we have, and this is good news, and this is worthy of a big old honking amen, all right? Those in your notes who are saved can never be lost. Never. Jesus in John 6 says, all the Father gives me, I will never cast out he says this is the will of him who sent me that i shall lose none of all he has given me but raise it up on the last day 
In John 10, he says, I give them eternal life. What kind of life? Is that five-year life? Ten-year life? He gives me life until I screw up and then lose it? No, it's eternal life. And when does it begin? Upon death? Wrong. Begins the moment you trust Christ as Savior. The moment you believe and you trust Christ. He says they will never perish. He says no one will snatch them out of my hand. How powerful is God? How powerful is Christ? No one can snatch you from his hand. People who have believed that you can lose your salvation have responded to me when I quote that verse and they say, well, no one can snatch me out of his hand, but I could jump out. And then they are pretty pleased with themselves like they just dropped the mic or something right there. Are you serious? That's your argument right there? That Satan is not powerful enough to wrestle you from God's hand, but you can wiggle through his fingers? Really? You know what? If you are born again, who lives in you? His spirit. That's a seal until the day of redemption, the scripture says. He is the earnest of your salvation, the guarantee. What happens to earnest money when you don't show up to pay the price in full? Huh? You forfeit that earnest money. Is God going to forfeit the Holy Spirit? Not a chance. He's not going to forfeit you either if you're a believer in Him. Verse 11, the author says, We desire each one of you to show the same earnestness, to have full assurance of hope until the end. Folks, God wants you to be sure of your salvation. He wants you to know that you know that you know that you belong to Jesus Christ. Why? Because in verse 12, so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Because here's what assurance does in your notes. Assurance empowers faithfulness. When you know who you belong to, you can be who you are intended to be in Christ. And it's the Holy Spirit that reminds us of that. His Spirit, Romans 8, 16, bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. But listen, there's only one way to have the assurance. There's only one way to be assured of this particular promise. And i leave you with this today. You must, and only this, you must trust in Jesus Christ who died in your place and rose again for your forgiveness and eternal life. Would you bow? If you're here today and you say, Pastor Scott, I have been playing Christian for far too long. I have been pretending. I've been immersed in the community. I have dabbled with the things of God, but it has never taken root in my heart, and I know it. And I'm ready to settle this right now. I'm ready to make it a commitment and trust in him i want it to be authentic in me if that's you today i want to invite you right now to make a decision in your heart i'm going to lead you in a prayer right now now hear me it's not a prayer that saves anybody it's not these particular words that you utter them and suddenly magically you're you're gonna spend eternity in heaven folks it's it's the decision to trust him to trust in his death and resurrection for your eternal life we, we have a model prayer to give you a moment in time that you can point back to and remember that is when I first trusted Christ. But if this describes you, then would you pray this right now where you are? Dear Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and I know that I can trust in no other person. I can't trust in my own work. I can't trust in any worldly philosophy to rely upon those things for my eternity, but I am trusting in you and I believe that you died for my sin, that you are the Holy Lamb of God and that you rose from the dead and I am believing on that for my eternal destiny. Would you come into my life right now and help me to follow you fully so that I will spend eternity in heaven with you? If any of you today, with every head bowed and eye closed, if anyone prayed that prayer, you meant it for the very first time in your life, this is your moment of conversion right here. Would you just let us know by slipping up your hand right now? We want to rejoice with you. Thank you, thank you. Anybody else? Anybody else? You can respond today. You can get it settled today. 
Thank you. Amen. Folks, look up here. Folks, we want to rejoice right now with the four people who trusted Christ today as their Lord and Savior. Can we honor the Lord for their decision? Amen. Amen. Now listen to me. This ain't the finish line. You trust Christ, that's not the victory right there. I mean, he's, he's won the victory for sure, but it's the beginning of your journey, your adventure in Jesus Christ. And now what, what do we need to do? We need to move on from the essential, the elementary doctrine toward what? Toward maturity. That's called discipleship. You need to become a disciple. If you trusted Christ today for the first time, you need to grow in your faith. I want you to look into Pathway. You can go to inthecove.com and uh, we'll get you enrolled in that. But here's what I'd like you to do today. If you trusted Christ today, you go out these doors. You take your first left. You go to that corner where there's a table and there are people there to meet with you, to pray for you, to talk with you, to encourage you. You got to tell somebody. It's, it's worth doing, committing to. It's worth telling somebody about. Amen. God bless you all. You've drunk from a fire hose today. I know it. But we love you, and we hope you have a great weekend. Go in peace.